Hi there, Lindsay here, The Frugal Crafter. Today we are going to do a really fun mixed media painting using pan pastels and colored pencils. And I'll tell you how to adapt it as we go along. If you would like a real-time version of this tutorial, it's over two hours long, you can find it up in Critique Club. A Critique Club is $5 a month and it gives you access to all the past five years of Critique Club tutorials and creative prompts. Plus, you can upload your artwork for feedback from me. So if that sounds good, there'll be a link in the video description and you can check it out. So what I'm starting off here is sketching on a piece of tracing paper. Now I'm folding the tracing paper in half because here's a tip. When you need to draw something that's symmetrical and maybe you're just not feeling it, maybe you're feeling like, yeah, you're just a little off or you're having a hard time, try drawing half of the object, whether it's a vase or a bottle or, or a cup like this. And then once you fold your paper in half, you'll be able to see through the back of the paper and you can draw the other side. And then when you open it back up, you can see through to the back and trace over that side and that's going to give you a symmetrical vessel. I think that's a really great tip because you don't have to have any technology for this. You don't have to have um, a computer. You don't have to have a printout. You don't have to have a projector. You can just um, you can just do it on your own. And you are drawing it. So I think that's a really good uh, good thing to try when you're stuck. And the other thing I like about drawing on tracing paper is that when we're doing our mixed media piece, we're going to be putting pastel in the background. Maybe you're working with some other media and you're and you're going to be covering up your lines a bit. You can always line your tra your uh, drawing back up over your picture since it's on tracing paper and it's transparent and you can retransfer your lines if you need to at any time during your painting process. So it's just another another great reason to sketch out on tracing paper. And probably the third best reason to sketch out on scrap paper and then transfer it to your good paper is because if you mess it up, you've got your line work again and you don't have to redraw it. Or if you decide that you want to draw it in a new medium, you like, oh, maybe I wanna draw this in watercolor, I don't have to redraw it. I can just take my pattern that I already made and just transfer it onto watercolor paper. So it saves the good paper. You can get that drawing practice in on a scrap and it just makes, um, I think it makes painting a lot more fun because you're not stressed about, oh, what if I mess up on that nice paper and I leave an eraser mark or I, you know, I wreck it. There's no worry, there's no worry here. And you don't even need anything fancy to do it. Now I use transfer graphite paper there to transfer my sketch onto my pastel mat. Now pastel mat is kind of a curious paper. If you've never used it before, it feels, it feels textured, but it's more like, um, gosh, it's kind of hard to, to explain. It's kind of like, it almost feels like, uh, vinyl upholstery, I guess. That's the only way I can really describe it, but it kind of behaves like a sanded paper, but it's kind of smooth to the touch. Now I heard that they make this paper by spraying a pulp on top of paper. So it's almost like how they make sanded paper, but it doesn't have that much grit. That said, it will take a lot of layers, but it's smooth enough that it doesn't damage my sponges here that I'm using to apply my pan pastel. Now we get a lot of questions about pan pastel. Pan pastels are almost like, they're almost like big pots of eyeshadow basically. They're that soft and you apply them using either big sponges or tiny sponges that are on little like palette knives. Now what I'm using here is the painting set of 20. And whenever anyone asks me my advice about buying pan pastels, I say to choose the painting set of 20 if you can afford it because it gives you some tools to apply the pastels and you get the 20 pure pigment colors. You can mix any of the other colors that are in the other sets from this set of 20 and um, it's just it's, it's a good way to get into it before you spend a ton of money to see if you really like it the other thing I like about the set of 20 the painting set of 20 is that if you decide you really love it and this is how I bought mine if you decide you really love it then you can buy the uh, tints which is all these 20 colors plus white and or the, the shades which is all of these colors plus black or the extra dark shades which is all of these colors plus extra black um, so that way you can kind of build your collection as you go without duplicates now I didn't exactly take that complete advice because um, when I first got started I just bought a few open stock colors to see if I like them and I love them actually that's not even true I bought a set of eyeshadows and started applying them with sponges to see if I like the techniques and I loved them. So then I bought a few open stock colors and I really liked them. Then I bought a couple small mixed media kits and I really liked them. And then I ended up going whole hog and buying the, um, buying the sets of 20 until I completed the selection. But I have to say, um, you really can do it all with a set of 20. I am glad that I have the other sets because I got them on a really good sale, but um, but it's definitely not necessary. So start with a set of 20 if you can afford it, or maybe one of the other curated sets is more to your liking. It's cheaper to get them in the sets and individually. 
and they last a really long time. I've been using these for many years, of course, not as much as I like to, but this is the year that I use my favorite supplies, I've decided. So these are gonna stay right on the shelf next to my table because I wanna use them more. Now these are those little tools I was telling you about. They're, um, they're like little plastic palette knives, like little offset spatula type knives. And they have these little foam socks that go on them. Now I did review some generic versions of these and they were decent, but I definitely think to buy a bigger bulk pack of the Pam Pastel um, little sponge covers is a better value. They last a little longer, they're a little better quality. But I will say one thing that works great that's very inexpensive is to use eyeshadow applicators. I found a set of 200 on Amazon once and I'm still using those. I use some for my actual eyeshadow, but I've got so many extras that I use for my pastels. And they work, they work as well as the soft tools. It seems like that material is very similar to the eyeshadow applicator. Now I did try to cheap out and use cosmetic sponges like the, the face wedgies that you'd put makeup on with. I don't know if anyone still uses those. Um, I use them more for craft purposes than makeup purposes, but they're not quite as dense as the, the Pam Pastel sponges. And I feel like I waste a lot of product when I use those. The Pam Pastel sponges are dense, so it doesn't absorb the product. The product just kind of stays on the surface and you can um, and you can apply it and you don't waste it by it getting soaked into the sponge. I don't know about the more expensive beauty sponges, but if you're gonna spend that kind of money, you might as well just buy the Pan Pastel sponges because they'll be about the same price or maybe even cheaper. Now, the, the surface on the reference photo I'm looking at is kind of like a fabric, probably a fabric tablecloth that's had a little bit of like runching to it, but I thought I preferred a wood grain table. So that's what I did when I sponged in the color for the table. Of course, you can do whatever you want. Maybe you want a pattern on a table tablecloth. Maybe you want something different. That's totally up to you. Maybe you want like a mosaic tile. Just try to, I would try to find like a reference image or go maybe take your own reference photo of tile at that angle or whatever you want to put it at, at that angle, if you're not familiar with what you're going to draw. Now the colored pencils I'm using are Derwent Lightfast. And the reason I wanted to use them is because I'm working on pastel matte, uh, really high quality, expensive paper. I'm using my Pam Pastels, really high quality product. I wanted to just keep it all top of the line. And then if I hang it up, I know I'm not gonna have to worry about anything fading. If I want to sell it, I wouldn't have to worry at all about um, anything fading. And yeah, I want to keep it classy. And this one, guys, we're keeping it classy. But you can use whatever brand of pencils you prefer. Um, the Derwent Life, uh, Lightfast pencils, I would kind of say, I'd have to say, if I looked at the Durant range, my favorite pencils would be the Light Fast pencils because I, I feel like they're such a, uh, a unique offering. They're, they're quite similar to the Caran d'Ache Luminance, I will say that, but they're just, they're, they are wonderful, they're lovely, but they are firmer than what I typically use. Now, if I just am, am coloring for fun or drawing for fun and not worried about longevity, I really like a softer pencil, such as a Derwent Chroma Flow or a Prismacolor. They're just easier to lay down. And I tend to do more blending by pressure blending and burnishing than layering. So that generally works better with my technique. But um, but the Derwent Lightfast are super pigmented and I just know they're not gonna fade. So that's what I went with for today. And I do like those pencils a lot. But if you do have wrist problems, you have any strength issues, they might be a little too firm for you. Um, and I think it's really important when you are considering making an investment, like a set of pencils like that, that you maybe buy a couple open stock or buy a small set first. I bought a set of 12 first just to make sure I like them before I in invested more. Um, and their set of 12 is pretty versatile. I mean, it doesn't have super bright colors, but that's kind of the nature of the light fast, but it, they've got a few and um, you know, it's a nice range. I definitely sketched quite a bit before I upgraded to the full set. And um, and also if you go to websites like Blick or Jerry's Artorama or Jackson's, you can buy singles of any of these pencils and you know just get a couple and see what you think and see if it's something that you really would want a full set of and that you'd really use. I think a lot of people don't realize that you can buy things like that. And yes, you pay more per piece. Like I was saying with the Pan Pastels, you pay more per piece when you buy them open stock. So if you know it's something you like, it's, it, it's, more cost effective just to go ahead and buy a set. But um, but I also like that the Pan Pastels offers it so that you can buy a set of 20 and then another set of 20 and not overlap. I think that's really handy. And there's open stock for when you run out. But I haven't run out of anything. <laughs> uh, no, no, well, maybe, maybe that'll be my goal this year to run out of a Pan Pastel. That would be great. That'd mean I, I'm doing some, some, serious, uh, some serious drawing there. I have no idea what I was gabbing about at that point. <laughs> the painting was something important because you can see me just wagging my hands all over the place. 
Um, now I am going through, oh, in case you're wondering what I have under my hand, and this is another tip, and it goes back to tracing paper. Um, when I use tracing paper, a lot of times I'm using it from a roll or I've got a big pad of it. Um, I save the scraps. These scraps are so handy when you wanna do work like this and you're working over pastel, you can lay that down so your hand doesn't smudge your previous work. Um, now pastel matte, you don't even need to put fixative on that, I find. It's very grabby to the material you're putting down, but if I rest my hand on there, I would pick up pastel, smudge it around. I don't want that to happen, so that tracing paper with the glossy side down works great. Glassine would work great. Even deli paper works great for this, but I save my scraps for tracing paper so I can have them for this reason. Tracing paper is just a really great studio staple to have on hand because of that. You could even collage with it if you wanted to because it's translucent. You can make envelopes with it. There's so many different fun things you can do with tracing paper, and it's not expensive, so... Um, so yeah, pick up a pad of that next time you're at the store. Sometimes you can even find it at a dollar store even. Uh, so here what I'm doing is I'm going over with pencil, but I'm not covering the entire surface. I am putting in the spots, specs, details. I am sharpening the edges. I'm putting in highlights. Um, that's, that's really all I want to do with the pencils. Like I mentioned, um, I... It, these pencils are a little on the firm side for me so I don't want to be killing my wrist you know pressing really hard I'm not someone who does a million layers although this paper is good for people that like to do a million layers but that's just not me um and that's fine we all have the way we like to work I really admire artists that put in that time and put in you know 40 hours of work on a colored pencil piece I don't have the patience for that and I like to get my color down quick before I lose interest and um and this is the way that I prefer to work. You can work however you like to work. There's there's no wrong way. There's just the way that um, that makes your soul happy when it comes to art. That's the important thing. So I'm just going in and adding those details, adding the edges, putting those little flecks of color. The uh, pencils stick over the pan pastels really well. But the neat thing about pan pastels is you can actually go back in over the pencils with the pan pastels. Now, I'm not sure if that would be the case on every type of paper, but when you're working on a sanded paper or this pastel mat, which has that that um, unique texture, you you can go back in with the pastels. If you're doing it, you know, if you had a lot of pencil down though and you had a real slick surface, the pan, the, uh, pan pastel won't stick, but this paper just takes so much media that it'll allow you to do that. Um, I'm not spraying this piece. The pastel mat comes with glassine, a sheet of glassine for every page. And so when I take it off the pad, I make sure I leave that glassine attached and then I just wrap it. I just um, I make sure I tape it to the back of the, the painting, tape the glassine like around the back so that it'll stay there until I frame it or I decide what I want to do with it. I don't frame things as often as I would like to, and that's purely because of <laughs> my laziness. I enjoy doing the painting, and then I just kind of like, ah, eh, this could live in the port, the, the pastel portfolio for the next ten years or whatever. But, um, but I do really enjoy enjoy working in pastel and colored pencil together. It, it's um, it's such a it's such a time saver. It's such a it's so satisfying to see everything to come come together so quickly, and. The other thing that I really like about the pan pastel is as I'm looking at those grapes, I'm noticing some of the ones in there are kind of almost like ochre and greenish, and they have these other colors in there. And you know, if you look at the color wheel and you look at the color red, directly across the color wheel is green. Those are complementary colors. And if you put a green next to a red, it makes each color seem more vibrant. So it's another way to make those grapes appear that they, like they're glowing. Now I could have had the background a little bit darker in contrast, to be honest. I probably should have, to, and I, it didn't even occur to me until I was looking at this voiceover now, um, looking at the voiceover, until I was making this voiceover now. Um, so it's it's nice to give your eyes a break and then reevaluate your painting. Um, at the end, I do like the way the painting came out, but now I'm looking at this, I'm like, yeah, I probably should have had a little bit more contrast there, had that background a little bit darker. But uh, that's why it's really nice to to evaluate after a few days and decide what you think. I don't think I don't think I would try to go go back and put a darker background in though. But just by evaluating and making that um, you know taking that time and allowing yourself that kind of like do over mentality. Just you know don't don't have your pride too. Don't have your pride too high that you can't look at your work and say, I could have done that better. I do that 
I do that with everything. I will look back at a at a video I did. I'm like, oh, I should have been more clear about that, or oh, I should have shown that step, or you know, I, I should have worded it this way because that would have been easier for people to understand. Um, we we're all growing and we're all getting better, so don't be afraid to critique your own work. Um, that's why I started Critique Club so that people could get some feedback when they're stuck or if they get stuck in the middle of a painting, they can share where they're at and be like, can can you help me? And the wonderful thing is. There's other people there that may have been in the same boat as you. They maybe got stuck at a very similar spot. They can offer their help too. Um, but yeah, it just gives you a second set of eyes. And I think that's that's really important. And we don't get that very much unless we're at art school, right? Or unless we're in an art group or an art league. We're kind of on our own in this artistic journey most of the time. So anything you can do to to move the needle, I think. Now, what I'm, I'm starting to see where the pencil makes a difference. If you look at the grapes up top versus grapes at the bottom, you can see that, that just that little bit of pencil that we put down really is pulling them out of the bunch and making them have some volume, have some shape, have some weight. And it's, it's nice to see. Now, when you're working with reflective objects like this silver, uh, this silver chalice, uh, you want to make sure that anything that would be caught in the reflection is being represented. So like the streak of red on the bottom of the the uh, kind of foot of the glass, that's that's a grape. That's some grapes. You're getting these blasts of red here and there. And then where you're really close to the grapes on the bowl of the cup, you can actually see the little grapes themselves. So um, that's kind of a, a little bit more difficult. So I think that's maybe nice to wait to the end to do, or at least until you've detailed those grapes in the, um, that are right up next to the, next to the cup. So you know exactly what they look like before you try to do the reflection. Sometimes, um, you might try to put a reflection in because maybe you're working from a reference and say you're painting some trees that are on the, that are on the lake and you're painting the reflection before you paint the trees. Uh, you may decide you want to paint a different tree and you might forget, oh shoot, I did this reflection just the way I saw in the reference photo. So now I need to keep my trees exactly the way I saw them in the reference photo, or maybe you don't realize that until after you've painted it. Um, so whenever there's reflections at stake, I say wait until you've actually finished your subject before you paint its reflection. Because you, you know, even, you can see that reference photo, I did not sketch all the grapes in exactly the same places. I just kind of like, oh, okay, yep. I mean, the cup is not exactly the same. It's not, a carbon copy, right? Um, so you want to make sure that your reflections make sense. And that that's kind of something I see sometimes. And and it's it just comes down to not understanding where reflections are. So to get better at that, you got to draw stuff with reflections. Find silver and shiny and chrome things around your house. You know, set them next to a light, set them next to other things, draw them. Um, draw pictures with chrome and reflection, reflective things in it. You will learn so much just by doing that because uh, you'll take some things for granted and then you'll be at the final stages of your painting and you'll be like, where did that come from? That's not even in here. I just made that up, you know? Because we often will paint what our brains think we see instead of what we actually see. Now here I'm doing some final highlights with a triangular soft tool and the white pan pastel because it's so opaque and it just sticks on top of everything. And it's such a, uh, it's such a, such a great way to make that glow and sparkle happen. Now at this point I'm thinking, I, this needs more, um, but I wanted to take a break. So I actually took a break uh, for a couple days. This was Friday when I was working on it. And then this is Monday when I came back to look at it. And I was thinking, you know, I really would like some grapes on the table. I feel like it needed a little bit more visual weight down there. I feel like it needed to, like the, the grapes are so heavy and the silver cup is so heavy. I felt like I needed something a little bit lighter. Now, because I had so much on the paper already, I used my electric eraser to erase some of the stuff off the, the uh, pastel mat. Pastel mat is notoriously bad for erasing. So uh, the electric eraser worked pretty good. Uh, my advice is when you do that, use just don't even try to brush them off. Don't try to you know, dust them or, or shake them off over your trash can. Just take a kneaded eraser and, and just press it into the crumbs and lift them up that way. Um, if you do shake it because you don't realize it and then they go everywhere, just take your kneaded eraser and gently tap on the crumbs and you can pick them up. But um, that could have been a tragedy, friends. <laughs> Luckily, uh, luckily I was able to save it. I'm using some purple pan pastel for the shadow. I'm doing the base of the grapes with pan pastel. And I'm also going ahead and putting some more shadow on the table because even though it's not in the reference photo, I'm feeling that it needs a little more visual weight at the bottom of the painting. And um, since I was putting little shadows around the grapes, like I can, it would make total sense for there to be some dappled shadow 
from the larger uh, cup on the, the, the cup part of, or the bowl part of the cup and that big glob of grapes. So I went ahead and put kind of a diffused shadow around to almost vignette it, almost spotlight it or reverse spotlight it and to draw attention to this little scene here and to add the weight. Even though the grapes are luminous and bright, they still, there's a lot of mass up there. So I didn't want my painting to feel awkward or lopsided. And again, that stuff comes with, it comes with practice. It comes with, um, the, you know, the more paintings you do, the more techniques you're going to know, and the more compositional skills you're going to know that you can do to make a painting come together a little bit more. Now, this is very reference photo heavy, um, but I think that's really nice when you're learning. And in Critique Club, I do go into in-depth tutorials. If you have something that you're shooting for, it's hard to get the result you want if you don't know what you're shooting for. So using a beautiful reference photo like this is just uh, is just a great way to do it. And I will link this reference photo in my in the description of this time lapse too. Um, beautiful photographer over on Unsplash. You'll really want to see that work. Um, and they have more photos up too. So it's just a treasure trove. But remember, you don't need to follow the reference photo. In fact, you shouldn't follow it 100%. You're, there's always ways you can improve. And photographers you know, they can move things around, but they're kind of, you know, they, they don't have as much flexibility as we do as artists. We can paint something else in there. We can move something. We can change a color much more nimbly and uh, use a reference photo as a starting off point and then, um, and then add to it to bring your vision into it. I decided I wanted to add a little stem on the two little grapes that are clustered together. So I did add a little bit of a a grape stem there. I was kind of like, oh, do I want to do this towards the end? But whenever I get that feeling like, oh, I'm afraid I'm going to ruin it, I decide to go and do it anyway because it's uh, it's usually, I mean, if it makes a mess, I figure out how to fix it and I learn something. If it if it works, great. So you either succeed or you learn. That's my motto when it comes to painting. And here I'm going through with a Prismacolor pencil. The Prismacolor white pencil is, in my opinion, the stickiest, uh, most opaque white. Well, I guess there's a soft white by Holbein, but I've never used it, so I can't speak for that. But um, I buy the Prismacolor whites by the dozen, and they are a wonderful finishing pencil. And so is the Prismacolor black, which I never used the Prismacolor black until just a few years ago uh, very much. But it is really great for going in there and getting those super dark, dark shadows at the end. For some reason, uh, using black color pencil does not feel as discordant as using other medium Media, using black other media. Um, like when I used the black pan pastel, I mixed it with other colors so it wouldn't be so harsh. But I find that the, the Prismacolor black pencil is is a little bit more, I don't know, maybe it's just colored pencil as a media where it's kind of translucent. It just seems to be a little more natural looking, in my opinion. And um, there's a, that's not an actual makeup sponge, it's a Jane Davenport baton blender, uh, but it's the same idea. And I just use those just to tap in a few more colors and highlights there at the end. They're very handy to have too. And those last a long time. I haven't had issues with those drying out like sometimes the little sponges do for the pan pastel after you've used them. But that pretty much does it. I really like how this came out and I hope you enjoyed watching this time lapse. And if you're interested in the real time version of this, you could check it out in Critique Club. It is a uh, fun, friendly groove of folks that just want to get better at painting and um, get some feedback on their work. So thanks for watching. Please give me a thumbs up if you enjoyed this. Until next time, happy crafting. Bye.